Amen. Thank you. And as you take your seat, just turn back a few pages to find Romans chapter 14. And you'll see very, very similar theme to what uh, Pastor Adrian just read to us from 1 Corinthians 8. Obviously, in the early church, this was a hot topic. What you could eat, what things you could do. Uh, some people didn't like it. Other people thought, oh, no, we've got this freedom. We should use it. Some were like, no, that, that offends me. You can't do it. So Paul is giving us a, a general Christian ethic of how to know what activities we can participate in, the spirit we should have. Now, he makes it plain. You never get to claim some kind of a, 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 of a trump card that you can play and say, oh, your action offends me. You don't get to do that. That's never in view here. The question is how we judge our own activity. And if we see that it can lead another person into sin, he says we should abstain. By the same token, we shouldn't judge people. If they're doing something that maybe we're not comfortable with, but they're doing it as unto the Lord. He's not talking about sin, things that are just completely contrary to the Word of God. But if they are observing certain days as holy days, and we say, well, really, all days belong to the Lord. We, we recognize all days as the same. They all belong to the Lord. Well, we don't get to judge them as though they're doing something wrong. And so he's helping us think through this Christian ethic. He spent <clears throat> the first part of the book of Romans talking about this incredible salvation that's ours. Now he's literally fleshing it out. That is, what does it look like lived out in the flesh? And one of those key ways is the way that we regard other Christians and the way they go about doing their service to Christ. I'm going to back up and read one verse, verse 19 of Romans 14, because it really is pivotal to what follows. He says, so then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Well, Paul here is explaining that it's not always a matter of keeping a list of rules on your refrigerator door and saying, oh, I do that one, I do that one, I don't do that one. He, 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 Paul, you know, Paul rarely completely ends one thought and says, oh, I'm done with that. Now let me turn to a, a new thought. Uh, and rather he transitions from one thing, like not judging your brother, to another thing, like not being offended by your brother, then still to another thing in the same vein, the reasons that these relationships are so important. Why you should not be offended by your brother. Why you should not put a stumbling block in his way. Now verse 19 it serves not only as a transitional sentence that gets us from one uh, paragraph into the next, but it, it's something of a foundational trust that is underlying everything Paul writes in Romans 14. All of the things he's telling us about the way we look at what others do and not being offended by what they do, but also considering them when we do things to make sure that we're not putting a stumbling block in their way. It gets down to what he says in verse 19. There are two things. And in all Christian relationships, we strive for these two things, peace and edification. What the ESV translates as building up. That's what edification means. It means building up each other. 
These are, these are the two things we want in every Christian relationship. Whether it's somebody of another denomination or someone of your own church or your own family, the way we treat them should be striving for these two things. That this, sort of, this is the baseline. We can have disagreements about certain aspects of worship and liturgy, uh, music, whatever. But what we're striving for in our relationship through it all is peace and edification. Peace is because of our common justification. I mean, don't forget that Jesus died to reconcile us to God and to give us peace. Why, Paul spent an awful lot of ink on that back in chapter 5. Have you forgotten? Let me refresh your memory. Let's remind ourselves of Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we've now been justified by his blood, much more will be, we be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You, you can't divorce the way you treat other people from the justification that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died to reconcile you to God so that you've got peace with God. It makes no sense then for you to have this incredible peace with God because Jesus atoned for your sin, and then you find it impossible to get along with your Christian brother or sister who also has been reconciled to God. Do you understand how inconsistent that is? How desperately wrong that might seem? Can we really claim that we've been justified and reconciled to God if we can't find it in ourselves to be reconciled to our brothers who have also been reconciled to God? See, because of this common uh, justification, we, we should have peace with one another. God has declared us righteous that we might have peace with him. It makes no sense that we would have peace with God but be unable to have peace with the other people in our lives who have peace with God. If we have peace with God, we're going to find a way to have peace with other believers. And he says, not only do we have peace, we also seek for building up. Edification because of our common sanctification. See, when God saved us, he saved us to justify us. That was instantaneous, right? That happened completely when God saved us. You can't be more justified 15 years later than you were when God saved you justification is binary it's either you are or you aren't it it has no degrees you're either completely justified by jesus christ or you're not justified at all it's the work of god it is unilateral it is uh monogenes. it is a, a single work of god that he does he justifies you and you can't be more justified at any point in the future 
then you are at the very first point at which God justified you. Now, sanctification is a different thing. Sanctification is progressive. Sanctification is hard work. Sanctification is death to self. Sanctification is constantly yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Can we be honest with it? Sanctification is often two steps forward, one step back, five steps to the side. You know, it's like uh, uh, we, we, the condo where we, we stayed on, on the big island this past week, beautiful place, but it has tiny little crazy ants. And I can go in the kitchen. I mean, this is the worst problem you have in Hawaii. You're okay, by the way. And, and these little crazy ants, they never go straight. Like, I, I noticed that going down the, the tile, the line of grout in the bathroom tile, and it followed that general line. But then it would go off, and it does, it's looking for something, right? It's looking for something, and it goes off, and it circles around here and goes back and forth, and then it gets back over on the line and goes up a little bit, and then back over here. And, and I was watching that thinking, man, that's a whole lot like my sanctification. <laughs> it, it's going a general direction, but there's an awful lot of stepping off to the side and going back, and you can see there's a general direction here, but he's not following the shortest distance between two points. And Christian sanctification is often like that. Uh, it, it is progressive. There's a general direction it's going, but can I say every day, today, I'm more sanctified than I was yesterday? Oh, I cannot. That's my goal, but it doesn't always happen that way. Ed edification is the means by which we say, I want to help you grow in sanctification. And as I help you grow, I want to grow. When I edify others, I grow too. And we grow together. And you know, there's just something about knowing you help someone grow in their sanctification that grows you. When I, whenever I, I, I tell Tanya something, I say, oh, this is going to be in this sermon. You taught me that. Man, a lot of times we, t we talk about the scriptures and she'll teach me something. And I'm like, oh, I got to put that in there. And I'll tell her, oh, you taught me that. And I just watch her light up. It, it means a lot to her that she has helped me grow. She's edified me. And me sharing that with her helps her grow. And this is what edification is. We're helping each other. We're pointing each other to Christ. We're giving each other attaboys. Way to go. Man, stay with this stuff. Oh, here, you taught me this. Oh, you encouraged me in this way. Oh, thank you for your prayers. Edification means we all have the same goal of sanctification and we need to help each other. And the way we go about exercising our freedoms has the purpose of pursuing peace and edification. So because of my salvation and because I value those whom God has valued in creation and the new birth, the desire for peace and edification demands that I establish some very clear priorities in my life. Paul, no, notice the argument he does not use. He does not use the argument, okay, if it's okay for you to do it and it's not sin for you to do it, just go on and do it. And whoever else has a problem with it, that's on them. Notice he never says that, does he? In fact, he says quite the opposite of that. He says, you need to be aware of them and don't you, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Now, he's not talking about like, oh, here's some saved brother. And because uh, you go to square dances, it destroys his faith and he goes to hell. That's not what he's saying. When he talks about you destroying uh, the work of God, what he's saying is God, God's at work in someone's life. And your goal should be through your actions and your sanctification 
that you are cooperating with God in helping them continuing to grow. And your goal can never be, well, I'm just going to do whatever I do and however it affects them or offends them, uh, I don't care. No, Paul says there are clear priorities that being a follower of Jesus Christ should establish in your life. In verse 20, he says the first one is kingdom joy over present enjoyment. So here's some, like in the Roman context, these Gentile Christians said, man, I love pork barbecue. Oh, pork barbecue is best. West Kentucky pork barbecue is the most spiritual pork barbecue out there. (laughs) And I love it. And so I'm going to eat it. And some of the Jewish believers were like, you're going to do what? That filthy, nasty pig that God wouldn't let his people eat coming up out of it. Well, the pagans ate that filthy thing, and you're telling me you eat that? Well, yeah, man. I mean, God sanctified that, and I can eat a pork sandwich and go to church and be just fine. Paul is saying, no, you should be willing to lay down your present, the joy of you participating in some food or some activity for the sake of the kingdom enjoyment of seeing someone grow in in their grace and knowledge of the truth. You're not putting a stumbling block in their way. He says in verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. There should be a deeper joy in ministering to your brother or sister than the joy you get through participating in the action, whatever it might be. Now look, I've spent a huge part of my life learning how to read the Greek New Testament, teach Greek, read Greek. Um, I grew up on the King James Version. I love the King James Version. You don't even get me started on, on my appreciation of uh, the King James Version. I grew up on it. But I don't think, I, I don't believe that the King James Version was just in 1611 just handed down from heaven. Like, like God favored all English-speaking people in a way that he didn't favor Swahili-speaking people. He gave us our own translation, and he didn't give, you know, he didn't give Romanian people their own. But he did us because he loves us more. I don't, I don't believe that for a minute. But you know, every now and then, I go, I'm invited to preach places, and the, whoever makes the invitation will say, Dr. York, do you mind preaching out of a King James Version? Now, I know what's behind that question. And it would be foolish of me to say, well, no. In fact, I tell you what I'll do. I won't even preach out of any English translation at all. I'll just bring my Greek New Testament and translate it on the fly while I go. And what are you going to do about it? You, you don't know if I'm translating it right or wrong, you, unless you can read it with me. And if you could read it with me, you wouldn't need the KJV to begin with. I don't say that. What do I do? No problem. I'll bring my King James Version and preach out of it because I believe it's the Word of God, just like I say this ESV is the Word of God and uh, the TLV is the Word of God and the uh, Christian Standard Bible is the Word of God. I, I think God has used scholars and manuscripts, and we're blessed to have a lot of really good translations out there, but if someone gets, wants to get hung up on one, it's not my hang-up, but I don't feel the need to straighten them out over it. I'm just going to humbly accept their request that I preach out of KJV. Because would I, for the sake of a translation, destroy the work of God in some church or some association? I'll tell you this. See, I could go to that association, preach to the 20 churches or whatever in that association, and insist on doing it out of the SV. And then when I leave, I'm gone. I've, I've come back up here to Frankfurt and to my, my bed and my home and I'm, I'm fine, but then they've got a fight on their hands down there among those churches. Some of them defended me, some of them upset with me, and look at the mess I caused simply because 
I wouldn't just humbly say, sure, no problem. Now, you're going to encounter situations like that all throughout your Christian life. But he says, you've got to choose the kingdom joy over any kind of present enjoyment. You're saying, I, I'm looking, I'm looking long term. What is the greater joy here, even greater than my freedom? To look at it another way, you're choosing other over self. I mean, I can demand my rights. I, I should get to preach out of whatever translation I want. Or I can defer to my brother and say, absolutely, if that's what you prefer, I'll be happy to do that. There's just something about us that we just want to assert our rights, don't we? We want to claim that I can do whatever I want to do and you have to put up with it. But Paul knows none of that. He says we should prioritize our relationship over rights. I have to prioritize the Christian relationship over my personal rights. I need to think of the fellowship and the fellow that I might be influencing. This is what he says in verse 21. <clears throat> it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Now, Paul has already theologically laid out for us that there's nothing wrong with eating or drinking a certain thing. Remember in the book of Acts, uh, the Lord ta taught Peter this lesson. Remember, he gave him a vision where he showed him all manner of unclean animals that the Jews weren't allowed to eat, and he told him, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter he put him in the position of having to correct God. Now, Lord, you know my whole life, I've never eaten that kind of stuff. I, well, I, you're asking me to do something wrong. God said, don't you call unclean that which I have cleansed. Now, how I thank God for the freedom we have in Christ every time I put a piece of bacon in my mouth. <laughs> it's just like, yes, hallelujah for the cross. <laughs> uh, I just absolutely love it. And I'm glad I'm not under law. But frankly, if I were around some group of Christians who thought I shouldn't eat bacon, now, I can argue till the pigs come home <laughs> that it's okay for me to eat bacon, but I need to prioritize the relationship over the rights. This is what Paul is saying. I need to think of fellowship and the fellows that this affects. And he says, I need to think about the potential effects over the personal entitlement. Oh, I've got the right to do it. I've got the right to eat meat or drink wine or do any number of things. But if it causes my brother to stumble, then those potential effects are not worth my exercise of my entitlement to the thing. See, part of the calculation has to be about the effect of my action, not simply whether or not I may do it. I mean, I'm entitled morally, but I might be bound relationally to lay the thing down and say, oh, this is, this is not good. And then in verse 22, he says, we've got to prioritize personal devotion over public demonstration. Now, this is a curious verse, and I think people misunderstand it. But he says in verse 22, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Now, taken out of context, that might sound like he's saying, you just keep your faith to yourself. You don't try and make anybody else a Christian. You don't try and convince anyone else that Jesus is the only way. You just keep that stuff to yourself. And that's indeed what the world often wants us to do. 
But let's be honest with the context because context is everything. Context is everything. And the context here is clearly not talking about not sharing your faith with unbelievers. He's talking about your relationship with other believers, is he not? That's the whole context here. And he's saying, okay, you have faith that you can engage in this particular activity and it's not a sin. You've studied this out, you've prayed about it, you see in the scripture you're given freedom to do that and you have no, no pang of conscience about it whatsoever. But what he's saying is you make sure that you are not evangelistic about freedom instead of being evangelistic about the gospel. I, I know Christians that are far more evangelistic about their freedom than they are about the gospel. They, they are more insistent on, on convincing believers to do something that they feel the freedom to do than they are in convincing lost people to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And Paul says, now look, this faith that you have that enables you as a mature, strong believer to participate in this particular activity, it doesn't cause you to sin. You're not tempted to sin. You can do this thing in moderation. It doesn't control your life. It's not a problem to you. Okay, that's wonderful. But you keep that between you keep that faith between you and yourself. Don't go around trying to convince everybody else that their faith is inferior to your faith because you've reached this level of maturity that you clearly don't believe they've reached. You keep that to yourself. That, that personal devotion that God has given you, you keep it between you and him instead of some public demonstration. You know, some things are free. You're free to do them, but they're intimate. And they should stay that way. There are intimacies between a husband and a wife that are they're totally free, but they don't need to go around talking about it all the time. You know what I mean? Christianity is like that. You can have freedom between you and the Lord in many ways, but that's not the essence of Christianity. The essence of Christianity is the gospel. That's what we need to talk about. And anything that is outside of the core of the gospel, we should be willing to give up if it's going to get in someone else's way, if it's going to cause them to stumble, if it's going to take someone off the track. Well, then we prioritize our personal devotion and we keep that private over our public demonstration trying to convince somebody else that they should be as mature as we are. And you should prioritize conviction over carelessness. Really, the second part of verse 22 down through the rest of the chapter, this is precisely what Paul's saying. He says, now blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. He said, you're blessed indeed if you're a mature enough believer. You've studied this thing out. You feel completely free that you can eat bacon or you can drink alcohol or you can go to this particular activity. Let's say that as honest as you can be before the Lord, you've reached a scriptural conclusion that that thing is not in and of itself sinful and uh, you, you would give it certain tests. Well, does it control me? No, I, it doesn't control me. Uh, I'm willing to lay it down at any time. Does it harm me? Does it, is it an obstacle to somebody else? And all those things, you ask those questions and you reach the conclusion, I'm not sinning in this. I'm free in this. And you say, okay, I, I feel this, this freedom. Well, Paul says, man, you're blessed indeed if you have no reason to pass judgment on yourself for this thing that you approve. You're not doing it uh, in some inordinate way. I mean, there are good things that can become bad things. Would you agree? You can, you can do good things to the degree that they become bad things. Is it wrong to play a video game? What do you think? 
is not inherently wrong. Do some people play it wrongly? Uh, you know, uh, when seminary wives come to me and say, you know, if my husband has any free time at all, he's playing a video game. He's playing, you know, Minecraft or something, you know, find the hidden Bible or whatever it might be. They, <laughs> they, they, get, they give it some spiritual reason. They get on there with the headsets and, you know, they're, they're somehow connected to other seminary students somewhere playing the same game. That's not, it. That's not inherently wrong. Could they do it to the point where it interferes with other things they ought to be doing, like spending time with a wife and kids? Oh, I think we all know that can happen. Uh, can that happen with a golf game? Can that happen with UK basketball? Can't happen with UK football. <laughs> it, can it, can, it can happen with basketball. There are things that we'd have to say in and of themselves, they're not wrong things. And I have total freedom in those things. But I can do them inordinately. I can take a good thing and turn it into a bad thing by the very way that I do it, by divorcing it from the glory of God. When I can do this thing to the glory of God, oh, it's reasonable to have some recreational time. It's reasonable to have some fun. Uh, that's a good thing, a healthy thing. And so I'm doing this in a reasonable way that's proportional to the amount of time that I have. I'm not letting it take over my life. Paul says, man, you are blessed. If, you're, if there's an activity, you've searched the scriptures, you've prayed about this, you, to, you have total freedom to do this. There's no doubt in your mind you're doing it well. You feel like you can do it to the glory of God. He says, you are blessed if you do that. But look at verse 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. You see, the real blessing comes in having freedom without doubts because you've studied the Word and demonstrated a, a surrendered Christian lifestyle. You're not just looking for an excuse to do what you want or to sin, but you're truly enjoying a freedom in the Lord and as unto the Lord between you and the Lord. You aren't partaking in doubt. Let it be enough, Paul says, that you enjoy that. Be evangelistic about the gospel, not about your personal freedom. And, and if you have doubts about it, if in your heart there's that nagging sense of just this just doesn't feel right to me, Paul says, then you should abstain. If you can't do it in faith, that it's glorifying to God, then don't do it. And you say, well, I, you know, I don't know, but I can't really give it up. Okay, then you're saying that thing, you are under its power, whatever it is. You can't give it up, you're under its power. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, okay, I, I won't be brought under the power of anything. I belong to the Lord. If, if something has power over me, then I've crossed the line. And this is what Paul says, when you can do it in doubt, it's not taking over your life. It's not causing someone else to stumble. It's not hurting someone. You have faith that you can do this for the glory of God, and that's wonderful. You're blessed. But if that, dag that nagging doubt persists, you better be willing to walk away from it because anything in your life that doesn't grow out of your faith in Christ should be forsaken. Paul says you should be willing to let go. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now do you see that for the Christian, it's about bringing everything in our lives under the Lordship of Christ. 
so that whatever we do, it's from that place of faith in him. It's about bringing glory to him. It's about honoring him. It's about pursuing peace and edification with my brothers. Now, I, just think about yourself. Because he began this passage by saying, for the sake of food, don't destroy the work of God. Well, that would be a bad trade, wouldn't it? For the sake of food, that you would destroy something that God is building, something God is working. Think about yourself. Your sin, just the knowledge of your own sin tells you how much Christ had to pay for your salvation. Would you admit that's a high price? Would you admit your sin is so great that only Jesus could make the atonement for your sin, that there's no other person that could pay the penalty of your sin? There's no other person that could ever atone for your sin. That the cost of your sin was so great that only the blood of Jesus could pay for it. Now, I want you to think about the value that means that God placed on your life. That he paid the greatest and highest price, the only possible way it could be paid by the blood of his own son. Now, you think about God's forgiveness for all your sins. Because your forgiveness, the fact, the fact that God forgave you, your forgiveness tells you how much then you have to care for your brother. Because Jesus made it plain that if you can't forgive, you aren't forgiven. If you're forgiven, then you should go through life with such a light heart that you can look at somebody and say, hey, that's okay, man. God has forgiven me all my sin. I sure can forgive you what you did to me. Why, you sinned against me in this particular way, but man, God forgave me all my sin so I can forgive. What Paul is training us to do is to value others based on what God has done for us. Knowing the value of Christ's death establishes the value of another's life. And if you see them as the work of God, God made them, God bought them, Christ died for them, God loves them, you can't treat hurting them lightly. Everything in you will want to pursue peace with them and edify them because that's what salvation did for you. Now, if you've never put your faith and trust in, in Jesus, then you're not going to feel a need to love your brother or your sister. You need to find the love of God yourself. But if you have turned to him for the salvation that he offers, then how can you disregard or treat lightly the value of your brother or sister's life? How could you dare ever say, well, they're just going to have to work this out on their own. I don't care what they think. Can you, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. But when you see them the way Jesus sees them, you're going to love them and serve them and pursue peace with them and edify them because that's what Christians do.